and welcome to Inside the Women of Denver. I'm your host, Crystal Covington, and on this episode, we're talking about love, personal growth, and stress wellness. First up, does your love life need a pick-me-up? I've got just the remedy. Check it out. I'm here with sex and relationship expert, Hillary Silver, and she's gonna share some of the most common challenges couples face and her model for healthy, amazing relationships that last for the long haul. So, I'm so excited to talk about this topic because I've been married for like, I think it's going on nine years this year, and challenges always happen no matter how long you've been together. So it's really important to know how to handle those challenges. So first off, I'd like to know what are some of the most common challenges, and we'll go from there. Well, I, I mean, relationships have their seasons, and so it depends mm -hmm. where you are in your relationships. In yes. the love life cycle is what I like to call it, um, and couples that... Um, have young kids have specific challenges and yeah. couples that have been together for a long time have specific challenges um, but it always comes back to how both people are showing up in the relationship mm -hmm. um, and to it's really important that both people are full whole self-defining yeah. self-determining autonomous people so that one doesn't overpower the other that's so huge. I don't even know, like that's one of the things that we've always talked about, making sure that we're always kind of in alignment with each other because it would be easy, you know, for us to kind of grow apart if we're not kind of paying attention to that. Where are you, where are you? And asking that question constantly. Mm -hmm. So I feel like one of the biggest challenges we try to overcome constantly is just making sure we're always on the same pace and the same page. Mm -hmm. And making room for both people, Yeah. right? So what I like to say is make room for two. Every relationship yeah. needs to have room for two. And every relationship always has one person who's more dominant than the other by, by nature. That's mm -hmm. me in my relationship. I'm outspoken, opinionated. Uh -huh. I know what I want. I'm enthusiastic. And I can easily just kind of elbow him out because uh -huh. he's more easygoing or laid back and yeah. wants to me to be happy and doesn't want to rock the boat. So there's always one in each uh -huh. relationship who's a little bit more than the other. So it's really important to make sure that you're navigating right. that balance of power because when that's off, it affects everything in and out of the bedroom. Mm -hmm. And I bet that changes over time because as people, you know, mature, <clears throat> they kind of, ch their personalities kind of change. I know that I've gone through several different seasons in my life, let alone in my relationship. Right. And my behavioral patterns have changed. <laughs> so I might have been a little more easygoing earlier on. And now I think I've gotten, I've grown to be more outspoken and dominant, but still, you know, my husband's um, always the, he's always been kind of more dominant than I am personality wise, mm -hmm. but I've kind of You've come into your own. a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah well, and, yeah. And, and, a, and a healthy relationship will be flexible enough to uh -huh. accommodate you finding your full voice and uh -huh. being your full self. Yeah. Yeah. So how do people in a relationship, and I feel like this is one that um, is really important to me. I, so one of the things that I've personally valued, and I, I knew myself when I got into the relationship, and I told my husband when we were dating, the most important thing to me is for me to feel like I'm being seen. And I even remember in the, um, the Beyonce film of her latest album, and she said that she talked about both in the relationship, do you see me, do you see me, you know, and that kind of being one of the challenges that she's dealt with in her um, relationship with her husband. Mm -hmm. You know, how do we consistently make sure that the other person feels seen and heard? Well, I think we all experience that differently. And so I feel seen and heard and loved and supported mm -hmm when, and it's kind of goes to the love languages a little yeah. bit, but for me, if my husband's not doing the things around the house that I need him to do, I feel alone yeah. and I don't feel important to him. And I know for him, he really needs to spend a lot of time with me. So it's really about making sure that when you're asking for what you need, you're not making it vague. Uh -huh. You're not saying, I need you to see me. You're saying, yes. this is what I need from you so yes. that I feel seen. So okay. it's really important to ask for what you need and Be to clear. ask specifically. Yes. And even sometimes put a qualifier on it, like I need you to move your tennis bag now, <laughs> not tomorrow. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> that will make me feel important to yes. you, right? <laughs> so I think we just don't realize sometimes that we're not communicating as clearly yes. as we think we are mm -hmm. and we miss each other. Okay. And then we don't feel important and we don't feel loved and then we get resentful and that's where things really start to fall apart. Yeah. 
I was personally guilty of that specific <laughs> thing for a while because I would say, well, you never do the dishes. And he says, well, I do the dishes. And so I had, he, I, we had to come to the understanding that I need him to do it at a certain time. He said, well, I didn't know that. I didn't know you needed me to do it before the night ended. <laughs> I thought it was just oh my whenever. God, it's so much better when the dishes are done before you go to bed, right? <laughs> right, especially right after you eat. So you can relax. But everybody has, you know, nobody wants to be told what to do. Uh -huh. But if we just make our wishes known yes. and we do it in a way that's clear, we also just want to make each other happy. That's all we really want. Yeah. Yeah. So what would you say is the number one tip that you wanna make sure that everyone in a relationship knows that will help them to survive for the long haul? Well, and it goes back to what I was saying earlier about room for two. Uh -huh. My model I call sunny side up because it's really instead of one, it, instead of concentric circles or one circle overlapping the other, uh -huh. it's two whole circles inside of a circle actually. I'll pull out my little. All right. <laughs> I brought a, <laughs> This is what I. Um, this is. These are just from um, workshops that I give. So I don't know if you can ah. see it, but this is my model, and it represents the two whole, full, autonomous, self-defining people inside nice. of the relationship. Oh. And this is the boundary around you. And uh -huh. so there's always needs to be room for two. Yes. And when you, um, when you don't like. Well, what we don't want is this, uh, okay. <laughs> is one person is half in and half out. Okay. Um, and what we also don't want is this, What's that which one? is someone coming in. Oh. And that could be... Mother-in-law. Mother-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> That's always Mother-in-law, <laughs> demanding bosses, oh, um, yeah. inappropriate members of the opposite sex if you're a hetero couple, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, so... You know, the old model that is still being shown and taught out there is this. Yeah. And this is just doesn't work because it never stays like this. Life is dynamic and one person is always more dominant than the other. Uh -huh. And so what ends up happening is this. I, I don't know if you can see because the colors are didn't print out very well. Uh -huh. But one overshadows the other. Okay. And the other acquiesces and submits and capitulates and withholds mm -hmm. to make the other happy or to keep the peace or to, you know, just to avoid conflict. Yes. And then that's when all things go wrong. That's when affairs happen. That's when divorce happens because yeah. people aren't feeling connected and they're both not getting their needs met. So my number one tip to have that is to really embrace conflict because you're going to have more conflict and you're going to need more communication skills okay. to achieve that state of two-ness so that you can navigate, well, I didn't get my needs met. Well, I'm not getting my needs met. So mm -hmm. who's, you know, you always get your way. Well, you, I feel like I always get, you always get your way. And so it's really about having those foundational communication skills right. so that you can achieve this. When that is off, everything starts to go wrong. Okay. Yeah. Beautiful. <laughs> well, thanks for the amazing yeah. tips on, you know, handling those challenges so that we can have amazing, amazing relationships. Thanks for having me. All right. <laughs> awesome. Now that you've got your love life in order, it's time for some personal healing. Our next guest calls herself a body whisperer, and she lives for creating breakthrough health transformations. Take a look. Leslie Huddard with Body Wisdom Wellness is here to talk with us about the real secrets to physical healing. So Leslie, first off, I wanna know, let's define healing, okay? Yes. Let's start off there. That's a good place to start. Yes. So often people make the mistake like, I did in the past of thinking as healing as a physical thing. Uh -huh. I went to when I was in college, I had a lot of physical health challenges. I essentially became a natural health expert in my early 20s when I started going to doctors and realizing I know more about healing than the doctor does. Mm. And so I thought I would go to chiropractic school. Okay. But wow. I was a language nerd. I was still thinking physically. I lived in Japan for a couple years and I started Ooh. studying shiatsu, Asian body work. Okay. And so I would bike up the mountainside and go to this little two mat tatami room oh, and the teacher wow. would say look at the person crystal with your empathetic imagination which nobody ever explained exactly what that was <laughs> and know where they need to be pressed most in this moment okay and as kind of a skeptical east coast kid i was like i thought this healing stuff was about the physical body right um so i was a little skeptical but eventually i started to have the sensation and understanding of 
holy moly, their chi, their energy is telling me to go left. Like I started to have this sensation when I was working on someone doing body work uh -huh. of this force energy that they call chi in Asian, okay. Asian medicine. So I started to think, okay, well, healing isn't just about the physical body. It's also about this energetic body. Okay. That's so, deep. That's yes, really deep. Okay. exactly. <laughs> so I came to know that not just physical, not just energetic, but it, as I've worked with people in my clinical practice and done trainings over years, I realized mm -hmm. that healing is actually becoming whole. Okay. Healing wow. is the alignment between who you are meant to be in your heart and mm -hmm. who shows up on the outside. Wow. And so where that falls through can be any myriad of ways. It can be physical, it can be emotional, it can be the thoughts that we think about ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so we hear a lot of lip service to mind-body connection. Yes, I've heard of that. But we don't always know about how that exactly works. That's uh -huh. my specialty. Okay. So I would say healing is really in the alignment of who you are and what you're meant to be, these bigger yeah. questions that we sometimes ask in other realms, but don't need to, spiritually, mentally, emotional, and how that shows up in your physical body. Wow, what you just talked about was so powerful. So the next thing I want to understand is, so now I kind of have an idea of what healing is. I feel like I'm doing a lot of we're this like, now. Oh, I'm, we're I'm coming into alignment. <laughs> yes, exactly. That's good. It's yeah. working on you. Yes, I'm feeling it. <laughs> But if somebody wants to, you know, I've seen a lot about healing ourselves, you mm -hmm. know, what is something that we yes. could do to kind of work on, you know, self-healing? Yes. One of, so I teach a system that I've created over 10 years called the Body Wisdom Method. Okay. And there are certain principles that we really follow. So if I could give you uh, nothing else but a few things to start changing your mind of like, what is this healing myself? Uh -huh. Number one is that the body has a consciousness of its own. Wow. The body has its own consciousness, which means, you know, most of us, uh, those of us who have done like meditation and things like that are maybe more familiar with the mind. But for the most part, we think the things that I thought, the, the thoughts that I think in my head are me. Uh -huh. And we don't really pay attention to there's anything different in there. But when we start to do somatic or body-based type of work or healing, we start to notice people will often say, well, this is weird, but I'm, I'm getting this feeling like my body is saying this. Oh, wow. So it's a strange thing to wrap your mind about. So you might yeah. have to go on a trusting working hypothesis for the moment okay. <laughs> that there, your body has a mind of its own. And so if we can start to relate to our body as a friend mm -hmm. that is with us very closely, but we know just like a friend, you know, the friend's there and they have their own thoughts and they have their own agendas, but we get along very closely. This is one of the first major shifts we need to make to do really deeper level healing. Okay. Wow. That's a huge mindset yes. shift. <laughs> I don't know how I would get to that point. I know that. So I went to um, a acupuncturist mm -hmm. once who yeah. actually, she just kind of did some Morse code with my muscles okay. and came up with some answers. Yes. And it was just, it blew my mind. Mm -hmm. I went home going. Yeah. Like what the heck what just, happened? just happened? Right. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, how does somebody get to the point where they can even take that in emotionally and understand mm -hmm. that or you know, even accept that, that that the body might have its own kind of thought process or... Yes, good question. I think the first step is actually to start talking with your body. Okay. So I teach people some phrases, but the thing you can start to do, if we recognize that our body is like the best friend who's been with us our whole entire life, who every time it tries to talk with us, we kind of just tell it to shut up and close the door. <laughs> so it's a process of, Sometimes I'll tell people, set a timer and just have some inward time. Just like okay. people are now getting very used to doing meditation and mindfulness, yes. it might look like something doing five deep breaths and really even saying out loud, like, body, what's, what do you need me to know right now? Mm -hmm. And just noticing. Okay. Now, it's not easy to do by yourself. So I don't want you to feel bad if you're like, well, that sounds really strange. I tried yeah. that. It didn't work. <laughs> So this is part of my work with people and what I do when I train women over a series of months is to yeah. really get those tools in yourself because we have this whole resource for better intuition, mm -hmm. for better decision making, for really knowing which way to go. Yeah. We've all talked a little bit behind the scenes today about like, well, how do you know when there's so many things that you could do? Yes. And my answer for that is that you trust the wisdom of your body. And there are ways to do that where you can even use it in your decision-making of really knowing what's right for you. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. 
Well, thank you for introducing <laughs> me to this topic. I feel like I'm gonna go home and I'm still gonna be doing right. this. <laughs> yes. alignment things. Yeah, yeah. 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 Thanks for start. talking with us about the energy and about what it really means to heal and for giving me a new way to express myself. <laughs> yes, <laughs> wonderful. Yeah. Great, well, thank you so Thanks much. Thanks so much, glad to be here. <laughs> Now that was truly enlightening and an absolutely perfect transition to our next guest, who's gonna share some stress wellness tips to help you reach your peak performance. The secret to your best life isn't about eliminating stress. It's about getting the right amount of stress. Did that just blow your mind? Well, there's more where that came from. We're talking with Nina Sinovia, founding director of Solanco Biofeedback Institute, and she's gonna share with us a unique theory of stress and how we can create strategies for a better, healthier life. Nina, I'm so excited because I am stressed out every day. I need your help. <laughs> You're like most people that are walking around that are stressed out. Sometimes I do presentations and they say, if you didn't remember how to get home last night, I'm gonna leave before you because oh that's you just on autopilot. That absolutely happens. I have to keep channeling myself and remembering, okay, where am I? Because it's so easy to just zone out on the road and I it's like my body knows where to go yes but I don't actually know <laughs> how you got my there head how I got there right right that's when you know it's it's an a, acute stress situation yeah. so for for me and what I do in this theory is I explain that we're all operating on three levels mm -hmm. we're either under stressed and underperforming uh -huh. and so an example of an underperforming person might be the person sitting next to you at work that is always got time to check social media or Facebook and you're thinking I am working yes <laughs> yeah. I am working 15 hours and two hours just ramping up and this person has all this time yes. and that person that is underperforming is also creating stress stress is meant mm -hmm. to get you away from a bear that you see on Colorado Boulevard <laughs> it is not meant to keep you there forever uh -huh. right so the fight or flight so a person that yeah. is underperforming in that level will actually create more stress because what they then need to move into an optimal level of stress is a goal uh-huh so goal setting keeps us at a nice distance between where we are now and where we want to be okay and that level of energy that dissonance that gets us there is just enough to keep us flowing, yeah. keep us moving forward. So if you're stagnant, if a person is stagnant or someone that is managing a person is stagnant, then setting a goal helps is the fastest way to get them to that next level. Uh -huh. Setting too much of a goal creates stress and burnout. <laughs> <laughs> too many goals. <laughs> yes. I, I can relate to that one. <laughs> yes, so we wanna make sure that it's optimal. So. Yeah. What happens when a person is on the uh, opposite end of that? Mm -hmm. The stress and burnout in, you want to ensure that the person too knows that they can take control back of their life mm -hmm. and know that if they're showing up of, as their most, auth most authentic self, then that is a way to bring true balance to what they're doing and what they said they're going to do. Okay. So if a person still can't get out of that, I have initiated what is called DNA. And so I, I say to them, then you go into, what does this feel like in my body? <gasps> when I am stressed, I am not drinking as much water. I'm uh -huh. going for the sugary foods. Yes. I'm, I don't remember how I got home. Then I always activate in that moment, do not activate, DNA. Okay. So you notice in my body, this is what it feels like when I'm stressed. Mm -hmm. So I want to not activate that behavior. I want to activate a new behavior. And research has shown that gratitude is the fastest way oh. to get out of fight or flight. Wow. Gratitude. And you don't have to be grateful that, I am grateful to have a stressed boss that is now stressing me out. It doesn't have to be related. You can have a photo of family members okay. and photo of a child, photo of an experience. I often ask clients that, that I work with to get an anchor right okay. away. So kind of like I've seen, um, I can't remember what the movie was, but I was watching a movie and they had, it was a taxi driver and in her taxi car, him, him or her, they had um, a picture of like a, a beautiful place that they, yes. that they, that made them feel good. And yes. it was in the visor and they would look at that. Right. Because what we're trying to do is create an emotional response that's different than the emotional response you have when you're feeling stressed. Right. And that emotional response can then pull you out of that fight or flight. Okay. So the stress, whether it's underperforming, you have enough time to, 
to do all the social media when you should be working, mm -hmm. or optimum level of stress when things are just clicking. You hear people say, I was in my zone. Yeah. That's the optimum level of stress. And you can exist there every single day. Or, or when you're stressed out, maxed, and um, experiencing, about to experience or are experiencing burnout, mm -hmm. that actual anchor will ground you back into a space and place that says, I'm out of fight or flight. Any stressful moment takes you to a moment as if you are, in fact, about to be in a head-on collision. Wow. Your body is, is, is responding to provide safety to either flee or fight it Right. every single time that you're in stress. So when you don't remember how you got home, you really have been operating, am I fleeing, am I fighting, am I fleeing, right. should I expand to become bigger to fight this, or should I shrink to preserve everything so I can flee it? Mm -hmm. So when you are stressed, you ultimately want to use gratitude to pull to you out of stress. Mm -hmm. So what about um, doing nice things for other people? Does it work the same way? If you just kind of, you know, let's say you find a homeless person and you give them, you know, you have, somebody had just come up with an idea to have little packets in your car to give um, to homeless people when you see them on the street. What if you do things like that? Does that kind of bring you out of that? I have not seen um, acts of kindness really reduce stress at the level that I'm talking about. Okay. I'm talking about the stress that's sending messages from your heart to your brain through your central nervous system. Yeah. That is communicating to your body to say either you need to expand to fight this or shrink to become lighter to flee this. Okay. And so we're really talking about that that the stressful situation and gratitude can't coexist in the same space. Yeah. One either has to be dominant or less dominant. So when you're a spirit of gratitude, it really overshadows and sends messages to your your subconscious mind mm -hmm. that, oh, when I am stressed, I am going to reach back to a moment in time yes. that pulls me out of this. Okay. It's a personal experience and it stops that fight or flight up the central nervous system. Okay, beautiful. So before we go, what's one really great tip for um, for people to maintain that sense of gratitude or you know have that reminder of gratitude throughout the day as they're feeling stressed. So I use this every single day. Um, I sometimes cheat with devices uh -huh. that tell me if I'm stressed or not, but when I can't have access to that, I teach myself, I've taught myself and I teach my clients to actually do a breathing technique okay. to connect to that breath that is heart-centered because your heart has an intelligence center that is sending messages to your brain more than your brain to your body. Okay. And so I connect that to that breath and I, I say personal, my mantra is, I am grateful for the opportunity to sit with Crystal. Oh, I love that. I am grateful for the safety of a safe marriage. Nice. I am grateful for, and I do that until I start to feel the stress just melt away. You can use that technique of gratefulness in the mantra, and I hold an anchor uh -huh. with me often. For any situation, it could be work-related, okay. and you can say, I am grateful for this thing. I also and use breathe it out. and yeah. breathe it out. And yeah. I also use um, foresight every single day to say, what was I grateful for today? Mm -hmm. And in the morning I say, what am I grateful for? Uh, at night I say, what am I, what was I grateful for today? And then in the morning I say, what am I grateful for today? And I okay. choose one thing because yeah. I don't want to burn myself out. Right. So you just pick one focal point. I pick point. one focal point and then I am grateful if I can't find something, I use that in no matter what I'm doing. Beautiful. Thank you so much for Thank those you. amazing tips. Thank you. All right. Wow, what a great way to end a show. I am so glad you were here to join Women of Denver for another awesome episode. Always remember that you, yes you, deserve to be seen, heard, and known. I'll see you next time.